The opinions expressed are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the official positions of the sponsors, advertisers, or presenters. Advertising does not imply endorsement by the sponsors and presenters. Hey guys, Happy New Year and welcome back to the Lighting Controls Podcast. We have another fantastic guest with us today, but before we dive into the conversation, let me just take a second to remind everyone that today's episode is presented by the LCA, the Lighting Controls Association. And it's financially supported by the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors, or NAILED. Check out our website if you haven't checked it out yet, lightingcontrolspodcast.com. We have all of our episodes. Um, news feed as well as a merch store if you want to support the podcast. We also want to say thank you so much to Mick Wong for sponsoring this episode. McWongInc.com, that's their website. Check them out. They have some really great resources for lighting controls people who are either new to the industry or veterans. Um, one thing I was checking out, which I really got to give them props for, is their resources page, which actually has recommended design ideas for specific applications. Um, you know, they're not going to give you every little in and out of the solution, but it'll at least get the ball rolling. So say, for instance, you've never done, you know, a, a sports area, they have some recommendations, never done a classroom, they have some recommendations, it's a really great starting point for really anybody in the industry who just wants to get a sense of how their systems work, what their recommended equipment is. They've, But they've also got a fantastic support channel based here in the US. So definitely check them out. Great Bluetooth technology, mcwonginc.com. But anyway, so today's guest, we have Shoshana Siegel. Shoshana, do you mind just giving us a quick breakdown on who you are and what you do? Sure. Uh, I am an architectural lighting designer. Uh, I'm a principal at Hartranf Lighting Design, and uh, I am a member, less actively so than I would like, of the uh, Lighting Controls Technical Subcommittee for the IES. And I am the president of the New York City uh, section of the IES. So yeah, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, yeah, you you really are involved in a lot of lighting control stuff. Um, you know, I, I've seen many of your presentations, really fantastic stuff. And so it's really great to have you here on this podcast. Um, you know, I think one of the things that I'd really like to get your opinion on is where we are when it comes to lighting controls, especially in commercial environments. Like, what's your read? Well, yeah. So I think that we're sort of in this extended adolescence period. And <laughs> by that, I mean, well, so um, I think that Great we, I'm so, it. yeah, it, it feel, we're like, we're kind of cranky. We're kind of not entirely comfortable in our own skin. We kind of are, you know, here and there and never anywhere in between. Um, we, we have this fully realized digital source in solid state lighting, right? We're, we're, we're no longer using lamps and ballasts. We are using little mini computers with drivers and power supplies. And yet we still cannot seem in the States to get away from an analog form of control wiring in zero to 10 volt. Mm -hmm. And even those of us who really, 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 really want that to happen and are really pushing, find ourselves stymied by things that are completely beyond our control. So I mm. recently had a project where I specified a DALI system and my manufacturer of choice in this particular instance said, oh yeah, our DALI system doesn't work for lots of small offices. You really need to do zero to 10 volt unless you wanna have four sensors in every single office. I, I mean, I don't even know what, yeah, like I don't know what to do with that. And I literally, I yeah. really did at the very last second call the engineer and say, okay, we're going zero to 10 volt. I, I mean, there's no reason what for that. <laughs> what did the engineer the, say to that? The engineer said, oh, well, thank goodness. I'm much more comfortable with zero to 10 volt. And I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, really, uh, and it, I, I could, I mean, the other option would have been to find a different manufacturer, right? To say, okay, yeah. that's it. You guys are off the spec. Somebody else is going to get this job. But uh, as it happened, and as often happens in, at least in the commercial work that I do, if the, if the engineer has a, um, has a manufacturer with whom they are specifically comfortable, 
I'm pretty agnostic about whose system I use as long as they can, as long as any given system can accomplish my intent. I mean, I think, you know, from some of the presentations that I've done that my big thing is about documenting intent. I want designers yeah. mm -hmm. to be very clear about what they need to see, how they want fixtures and rooms to interact with the people in the space. So I don't really care who's Mm -hmm. product is on this is on the job as long as it can do what I want it to do. So when I if but that's one of those it's a double edged sword, right? You're going to live by that or die by that. So if I'm going to live by that, then when the manufacturer with whom the engineer is most comfortable says, well, we can't do it using the protocol you want to do it. What am I supposed to do? Mm -hmm. So because and then that puts a, a whole lot of pressure on me to then engineer a job. And I'm not an engineer. I'm a theater person. I mean, you know, there are sort of three ways into architectural lighting. There's the engineering route. There's the architecture route. And then there's what I feel is the best route, the theater route, <laughs> where we just like we're just like, hey, let's use some bubble gum and some and some twine and see if we can't build something. You're not finding any disagreement here from two you know, folks as well. <laughs> so, so you guys will appreciate my love of all things gaff tape. Gaffer's yes. tape yep. is will fix everything. Absolutely. And I really, I we, yeah. We've mentioned gaff tape before, but just for those who didn't listen to that episode where we talked about gaff tape, it's like duct tape but better. That's where I'm going to leave Much. it. Much. <laughs> But anyways, yeah, so I mean, as far as things go, it's we're in a rocky period still. And yeah. it's really yeah. there's there's a lot of contradiction. There's a lot of inaccuracy. There's a lot of mis misconceptions and confusion around lighting controls. And even those who are skilled and, and involved at the committee level in IES can be blindsided by the shortcomings of lighting control systems, which is mm -hmm. really unfortunate because you know, it'd be great if we all agreed like, hey, this is how systems work and we're just going to we're going to that's how we're going to mm -hmm. specify them. But we're not there yet. And so yeah. I'm yeah. curious if you have any perspective on how we can get there. I think part of the reason that we are where we are has to do with our commercial culture in the States as opposed to commercial culture in Europe, because I think if we look at where digital control protocols have really succeeded and taken off, it's in the European market. And I think that that has to do um, to a certain extent with our sort of uniquely American capitalist approach. And I'm not, I'm, I'm, that's capitalist with a little c, I think. Sure. I think that's right. Um, but what I mean is, is that we have this very specific commercial approach to commercial property, to intellectual property, mm -hmm. to what is privileged, what is not privileged, that I don't think carries in other places. And I mm -hmm. think that um, to a certain extent, we're, we may be protecting ourselves out of a really useful set of integrations mm -hmm. that, uh, and so it may require some sort of a, a mind reset to, for want of a better term, to get us to stop being so uh, territorial about these things mm -hmm. and and look more holistically. We don't look at anything particularly well from a holistic standpoint, I don't think culturally. So I think that that's part of our issue. Um, what we can do about it, I think the only thing we can do about it as specifiers is continue to keep pushing this idea of um, my job is to tell you my intent and how I expect these pieces to work together. And I expect mm -hmm. you as the vendor um, or as the contractor to provide my client with a system that does the things that I've told them and you it will do. So, um, I mean, not surprisingly, I'm gonna come back to if we have really good intent or really strongly structured intent, really well thought out intent, mm -hmm. we will hopefully eventually see better operating systems. Uh, so from, kind of, from your perspective, yeah, yeah. would you say that uh, Europe does control intent better than us? I don't know that I don't know that I have an answer to that. Um, I sure. haven't spent a whole lot of time um, analyzing European control specs. Yep. But what I do know is that, for example, Dali, I went to light and build in Hanover. So that's 24 mm -hmm. years ago. And Tridonic had a Dali ballast then. And it was fully mm -hmm. 
executable. You could specify a fluorescent job that integrated DALI into the control 24 years ago. We weren't even really at LED, we weren't really, we weren't at LED yet. We were still in T5 land. And, and yet they were able to do this, to achieve this digital protocol that we still can't somehow manage to put together and to get into the field. So I don't know if it's that uh, European specifiers are better at specifying intent. I think it just may have to do with the way the European market is structured a little bit differently. So um, I'm curious to kind of follow up on that though. <laughs> Is it so? Is it more around Dolly itself, or right, or as the digital communication, or is it something else? Like you know, is it is it really that Dolly communication in Europe that that is making this all possible for them? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think that there are certainly other forms of digital control protocol out there that are you know slowly gaining traction. I don't see any of them, whether it's a a Bluetooth mesh or or some other form of digital communication, I don't see any of them um, sort of taking the world by storm and and succeeding where anything else has failed. I, I think part of it um, has to do with the fact that electricians like to pull wire. And I'm not <laughs> in no mean I like I really I'm not I'm not slamming electricians. I, I think that they are um, amazing craftspeople and as a lighting designer I depend on you know, as a theatrical designer, I depended on my master electrician and their crew to realize my vision. And as an architectural lighting designer, I depend on, in New York, the local three guys to, um, to realize my vision. And I, and I respect that. And we all have a part to play. But electricians like to pull wire. So anything that doesn't have a wire attached to it, or in the case of zero to 10 volt, five wires attached to it, is something that is... Um, it takes it out of the ordinary building structure and that makes it complicated too. So, uh, I, I mean, I, I wish I had a better, I wish I could say this is like, this is the problem, but I don't, I think there are a lot of problems. It's a multi-layered problem and it sort of requires, you know, a teasing out. I mean, that, that, that agrees with the majority of what we've heard from, you know, everybody, yeah who has a different perspective of what's going on, has a different theory on why we are where we are, but it's not that any one theory contradicts another one. I think you're right. right. It is a complex issue and it's not so much a, okay, this is the one thing that needs to fix the problem and we just need to do it. Um, mm -hmm. But I think there's definitely some things that are worth focusing on more. And one of the things that you, have definitely created a soapbox out of his outreach regarding control intent. And it <laughs> yeah. seems as though control intent is absolutely something that we need to be doing, whether or not any of these other issues are something you agree with. Um, you yeah. know, without sure. a control intent, what are you doing? Right. I mean, I think <laughs> you need to tell everybody what it is that you think your system or the system that you're designing or partially designing, however you want to talk about it, um, is doing. You need to be able to say, this is what happens when somebody walks into their office. I mean, I, I, I use that as a, a really basic starting point. When somebody leaves their office, what happens? You know, and, and the answer is the lights go off. And then the next question is, well, what are the controlling variables, right? Time of day and the length that of time that the office is empty. And those things give you a, just even just those three questions give you a very basic sequence of operations and actually an equipment specification, right? It tells you that you have a vacancy sensor, which tells you that you have a manual override, which tells you that you also have a system that can sense time. So right there in three questions, you've sort of specified a little mini control system. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we need to look at, we need to be comfortable as designers looking at all of our spaces at that level of granularity. And really asking those yeah. questions and and walking ourselves through that checklist every time. Yep, and, and we completely agree with you. And and we've we've spent a lot of time Ooh. talking about this too with other people. <laughs> you know, it, well, from so there's two ways to look at this. Well, there's more than two, but mm -hmm. there's a couple. You know, a couple of ways to look at this from uh, from the side of the contractor as you're mm -hmm. looking through the drawings and you go through the intent and you read through everything. It makes it very clear as to exactly what this system needs to do. 
So, mm -hmm. but on the front end, it makes that very easy to get proper quotes and budgets for the owner and to really bring control system in line because far too often we've seen that there's no intent or a very vague intent and all the manufacturers have to just guess wildly at what this system does or put in additional allowances to account for things that may or may not have been in the documentation and and that leads to you know owners paying more for their equipment or overbuying or whatever. So the more information that's there, it, it makes everyone's lives easier. You as a designer get exactly what you want. The owner gets what they want. The contractor knows what they're installing. The programmer knows exactly what they're doing. I mean, it helps mm -hmm. everybody yeah, front to back. So I think that um, one of the things that needs to happen is people need to be not, people need to not be afraid to say, I can't quote this. Yeah. And I, 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 you know, I hear this a lot from colleagues who work for manufacturers who say, well, too many times I have drawings that are incomplete and I just have to guess. Well, what if you didn't guess? What if you just mm -hmm. said, I'm sorry, until you can tell me what you need your system to do, I can't tell you how much the system is going to cost. What's the worst thing that could happen? The worst thing that could happen is that they're going to go to the next person who hopefully is also on sits on the same committees as everybody else because you know it's a pretty small club right there's i don't know 25 of us in the world who care this deeply about this stuff so if they go from manufacturer a to manufacturer b and the people responsible for engineering those systems know that neither one of them is going to quote it without actually getting information then it gets back out to this on the specification side and i think it's um I mean, a little bit, there has, you have to, people have to be willing to sort of take that risk that, you know, I might lose one job, um, my charrette partner here, I might lose one job <laughs> um, in an effort to make sure that I, I'm not quoting a system that doesn't work, or I'm not quoting a system that is too much of a system for what I need. I think the other thing is, is I think that owners need to, um, they need to let go of the idea of, I just want the simplest thing possible to meet code because that's not a thing, right? That, that, that's as an owner's project requirement, simple to meet code is really not useful. And the thing about control intent documentation is that it's supposed to stem. And I know Webster, you know, this from our work on LP eight together, it's supposed to stem from this other document called the owner's project requirements. And right. this, this document is like the holy grail of specification documents. No one has seen it. It's the <laughs> it's the jabberwocky. Like no, really, like no one has seen yeah. one. Every time I ask for one, nine times out of ten, the architect says, "What's that?" Or I get something that is, I don't know, like cobbled together from eighty-seven other document documents. Or even mm -hmm. worse, I hear we're still working on that. Well, how could you still be working on the owner's project requirements when we're deep into the CD process, right? right? We're actually figuring out what we're building and you're still trying to tell us what we need. So yeah. I, I feel like there's, I mean, some of that, some of this falls on the parts of the market that we don't necessarily have any impact on, which is kind of unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Well, then, really and sure so yeah. just to stop you for a second, for, for those of who are who are playing at home and have not heard the term owner project requirements before and aren't privy to what it means do you mind just giving us a quick definition sure. of what that is so the owner's project requirements is really the design brief from the owner's perspective i want a corvette that's sky blue pink and has uh, doors like a DeLorean and can use a flex capacitor to go forward and backward in time. <laughs> it can be as ridiculous right. as that, or it can be as useful as I need a conference center that um, can accomplish 14 different types of video uh, broadcast and, rece and reception and also has um, operable walls and I don't know, yeah. is daylit to the it, greatest extent possible. It, it is, yeah, it can be anything, but it's right. it's a, a winnowing down of what I'm looking for as an owner. What am I asking you to build? And mm -hmm. and then the design team has the opportunity to then interpret it. It's like, you know, those, um, uh, those therapy-esque conversations where you're supposed to say to people, what I think I hear you saying is, 
And that's what the owner's project requirement is. The owner's project requirement says, I want X. And then the design team says, what I think I hear you saying is you want mm -hmm. Y. And then the owner is supposed to say, no, I don't want Y, I want X. And then you're supposed to come to a meeting of minds of what that means. And without that, it's very, very hard to specify something that's going to work because you don't know what you need. Well, and I think that that might be a part of this complex issue as well, is the fact that we don't have ownership telling us what they want. Um, and I think part of that, from what I've seen and heard from people in the industry, is the fact that there's this massive driver for why we have so many complex lighting control solutions, which is energy code. And we have a lot mm -hmm. of owners who don't even know what energy code is or why it's important. And so when it comes to what do you want your lighting control system to do, it's like, well, what am I required to do for lighting controls? Mm -hmm. And so yeah. it kind of becomes this closed loop. I think it's true. I think the other thing is, is that I, uh, well, I know that I have gotten projects been brought into projects because an architect has been scared by the energy code and has mm. said to an owner, I know you don't think you need a lighting designer, but trust me, you need a lighting designer because you need mm. to meet energy code. And while I am happy to take those projects and some of them turn out beautifully, the truth is, is that um, it would be most helpful if our architectural colleagues we're instead saying, I know you don't think you need a lighting designer, but you do. Full stop right there. Right. And then we were not charged with simply meeting energy code, right? We were charged with crafting a fully realized multi-layered visual environment, which is of course what we all really want to do, right? Nobody wants to just meet energy code. Even the engineers who spend all day laying out sensors don't really want to just meet energy code, they would also, I think, prefer to be crafting multi-layered, visually compelling environments. And I think if we were, um, and to a certain extent, uh, this has to do with, I mean, I, we talk a lot about how much we talk to each other and how we don't necessarily talk outside of the lighting world. And that yep. is its own problem too. I think there, I mean, it, let's just keep peeling the onion back and there's more problems and more problems. But, um, but the, you know, if we could convince people and by people, I mean, not lighting people that lighting was actually something that was, um, that as we all know it to be a really important part of the visual environment and that the visual environment was a really important, important part of the built environment, then I feel like there would be a, a, we'd all be on a better footing to sort of push some of this through. Um, I think the other thing is, is that we as lighting professionals tend to often be siloed away from ownership. The number mm -hmm. of projects that I work on where I interact with the architect or the interior designer, but never ever get to talk to the owner until sort of the very, very end part of the design process, if then, yep. is really pretty high. It's probably in the 70, 75%. Um, and that's, I mean, that's unfortunate. It's unfortunate for me because it means I'm designing in a vacuum. It's also unfortunate for the owner because it means that I don't have the opportunity to say, Hey, did you know that we could do X or right. are you interested in doing, in, in doing, I don't know. Are you interested in, I don't know, growing hyper hydroponic vegetables in your pantry? I mean, we could do that. Right. I, I don't know that anybody really wants us growing tomatoes in their pantry, but we could. You know, why not? <laughs> well, I, I, I think that that right there is one of the, the challenges in our industry as well, which is buzzwords and, um, mm. you know, latest and greatest technology, mm. um, tunable, human centric, et cetera, that um, kind of gets rolled in with controls at the same time because of mm -hmm. the need for controls, but isn't necessarily control specific. So, yeah. you know, from, from, a, from a controls design standpoint, I mean, where does the line get drawn when it comes to who owns what in that territory? Well, okay. I think that has to be, like, that's a project to project um, mm -hmm. question. I mean, I have a, I'm working on a project I've sort of come in at the sort of two thirds of the way in where the manufacturer was actually determined by the building that the agency that we're working for last built. 
So we're building mm. two new buildings. The building they built right before this, they used this manufacturer, so they want that want it all to be the same. Uh, okay, it's always a red flag in my mind. Yeah, like, I, is it the right system for the right? And this particular project has um, historic aspects. It has new construction. It has some whiz bangy theatrical stuff. It's going for lead and well. It's got all wow. kinds of stuff. And the question is, can this one control manufacturer actually handle all of this? And in this particular case, this particular manufacturer does not mess with DMX. And there are color changing fixtures. So yep. just at the get go, we have a DALI system and a completely separate DMX system for the red, white, and blue, green, whatever is gonna go on on the facade. So we're already starting with two systems. Well, I think I, I that mean, that's go wrong there. <laughs> that's that's the challenge, um, as well as uh, you know, as a specifier, when you are told design around this manufacturer rather mm -hmm. than pick the manufacturer that meets your intent, because now you're you're instead of trying to identify which manufacturer can provide all the features that you've asked for, you're trying to identify which features you can provide with the manufacturer you're being told to use. Yes, in a hundred percent. And I, I try in a, as many times as I can, I try really hard to say, let's wait and figure out what we need. And then we can talk to who can provide. Sometimes yeah. that works. Sometimes it doesn't. The other thing too is, is my specification says that I want the control vendor to provide me line by line a an accounting of how they're going to meet my intent it's there in my documentation and it's a requirement of the submittal and i think i've gotten it exactly zero times without asking for it <laughs> i i mean it's yep. there it's in english i write it out yeah i, so, I yeah it's I can understand the owners though coming to you and saying, we really want this system, right? You, if, from the owner's perspective, you can look at that and say, we've got this other building, everything works great. My staff already knows it. This, you know, we want the same mm -hmm. thing so that I don't have to train all these people on something different. But like you said, it's then having those tough conversations with people and being being able to get in front of the owner. That is right mm -hmm. one of the That's biggest really challenges sometimes. Yeah, I think that's really it is that I look, if you tell me that I need to reevaluate how I'm conceptualizing certain functions because this particular technology won't work. I mean, there are certainly things that you can do. Here's a really good example. This is like not really related to control, but we all know that you can't really make an effective white with RGB right? Mm -hmm. We're supposed to be able to, but we really can't. If you really want white, you need that fourth channel. All right. So if somebody says to me, I need you to create white with RGB, I'm going to say to them, you know, it's not really going to work. Are you okay with that? Right? I'm going to show it to them. I'm going to mm -hmm. get some sort of little mock-up going because I have this very, very strong rule that's mock-up or F-up. And um, <laughs> I was waiting. I was like, do I have to pause for that last one? Um, so, yeah. So I'm going to bring my little, you know, three slider thing. And I'm going to say, okay, this is the white that you can expect to get. Is that okay? And as long as I'm in front of the right people and they say yes, then I can document it. So from a sure. CYA perspective, I'm okay. And everybody, nobody is surprised. But if I yeah. can't get in front of the right people and I can't find out until too late in the process what the issue is, then it's almost impossible for me to make sure that everybody's happy and that everybody really is forewarned. That's really what I'm yep. what I'm most concerned about. I don't want there to be surprises, you know, six months, a year, two years down the line when we turn this thing on and I'm waiting for a big ta-da moment and everybody else is like, oh, well, that's not what we thought it was going to be. And why is it blue? Why is it pink? Right. Why is it? Why when I shake my head, do the lights flicker? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. How come when you dim that light over there, that one over there is suddenly flashing? I mean, yep. You know, like it would be better if we could avoid that, I, I think in yep. general. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I think the thing that 
is really interesting about that philosophy is that we don't do as many mock-ups as we probably should, especially as it pertains to certain dimming protocols. I'm using protocol in a loose term here, um, mm -hmm. but phase dim. In, yeah. in oh. my personal opinion, you always want to mock up a phase dim application because you don't know what's going to happen. No, mm -hmm. you don't. And it, 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 is, it can be really ugly and really painful. Um, the other option, of course, is to try to avoid phase dim, like the plague, which is sure. sort of my way of... <laughs> which is fine as long as you don't have anything that's fancy and decorative, right? So as long as you're doing things that are, you know, basically architectural and, um, and as long as your, your whiz-bang moments have to do with um, a technical protocol, right? So a DMX or some, some other form of a digital means of communication, you're fine. As long as, you, but, you know, bring in a crystal chandelier or some, you know, froofy feathery thing and you're kind of stuck. Phase dim is what you got. Mm -hmm. um, right. mm -hmm. I mean, I think that there are, we, we have tried um, on, in the, in the lighting controls com community and on the IS committee, we've tried really hard to um, to encourage people who might be providing phase dim loads to be a little bit more open about what that means. But the truth of the matter is that um, the people who it's often it's often a, a mystery to to the people who are providing the the fixture as well. So it it requires. It requires all of us to have a level of testing facility that we just don't really have, especially now that so many of us are working remotely or at least working partly remotely. It's really difficult sometimes to get, I mean, who's got a testing right. bench, right? right? Like, And so what do you think the resistance is to giving up phase dim? Yeah, resistance. <laughs> <laughs> Unintentional but, um, fun. <laughs> no, I love that. <laughs> well, I think really what it comes down to is um, it is much easier to use a retrofit lamp than it is mm -hmm. to rewire and rebuild a fixture to be native LED. Um, yep. And we're still in this, um, in this adolescent phase of neither here nor there where a significant number of decorative fixtures come with screw-based sockets. And mm -hmm. I, I think, honestly, that if we focused, this is going to sound a little heretical, but if we focused less on outlawing or on mandating efficiency and a little bit more on mandating connection uh, apparatus, we would be through this process faster. Mm -hmm. So if there was no such thing as a candelabra-based socket, we would not have <laughs> candelabra-based lamps. Like right. it's pretty straightforward. We're going to have candelabra based lamps as long as there is something to screw them into. If we mm -hmm. would focus on how that connection is made electrically and mechanically, then we would be done with this. And then we would have no need for that particular set of dimming protocols. We could just. Well, I think that's, that's a really interesting observation. And I think it does relate directly to why we are where we are when it comes to protocols in general is because a uh, candelabra base is a standard. A E26 yeah. medium base is a standard. They're both standardized and they're ubiquitous. We don't have a standardized ubiquitous lighting control system. Well, there is that, but we do have open source or uh, anti, -pro anti standardized protocols. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's a, you know, that, that is beginning to get us to where we need to be. But even so, within that, you know, to go back to my example of the, well, our DALI system doesn't work the way you want it to work. There are so many ways to implement even a standardized protocol that, um, that I, I'm not sure that we can have a standard protocol without, um, without mandating that, you know, all, I don't know, what are we, what are you going to say? All linear products must operate under X mm. protocol. Like, how do you do that? Mm, exactly. Sure. You yeah. know, I, I'm not I, sure I, how you, yeah. 
No, I think I think that 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 is a, a really good point regarding standardization. And additionally, um, I would say that it's kind of hand in hand with education. I think mm -hmm. with a with a socket, there's not so much education you need. You, you know, it either fits or right. it doesn't fit. Um, oh, yeah, there's yeah. that. Wh whereas <laughs> with you know a protocol, it's a much more complex system, and and mm -hmm. to standardize it, you know, if you look at for instance, ANSI's DMX 512 standards. I mean, people who aren't familiar with reading standards are going to lose their minds reading those. Um, Some of us who are familiar with reading standards. Lose <laughs> sure. our minds. <laughs> Fair enough. So, I mean, it's it's not an easy thing to get familiar with, and therefore it's even more challenging to learn the ins and outs of a standardized system to be able to predict these things such as, oh, your system can't do that with Dolly? Um, right. So I think there is sort of a, a, a real difficulty when it comes to this. And one of the things that Ron and I like to stand on a soapbox regarding is encouraging standardization. But I think mm -hmm. your point is really valid, which is like, okay, but how? Right. Right. So, and I think the other thing too is, is, you know, there are things that, so as a really interesting example that sort of came up to bite me the other day, um, I was looking at both DALI and DMX for, or sorry, DMX 512, um, to, <laughs> a, as a, a means of, um, of, well, cause you know, DMX is a wrapper, DMX is a bike, DMX is a shoe, DMX 512 is a control protocol. Um, there, was a, there was a whole education. We can, we can have, that. we can have this debate. I mean, I, I've been on, a, I've, I've had heated debates over also, what do you call zero to 10 volt? So we can, oh, we yeah. can go down that road if we want to. Wait, which one? But, yeah, exactly. Which zero to 10 volt? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> yeah. So, okay, now we're really geeking out. Um, okay. <laughs> Rewind. Um, so, but I was looking at the two protocols and I was trying to figure out like, which is the better way to go? Why do mm. I want one over the other? And the, what it came down to is I wanted to control, I didn't really need to control multiple aspects of the source, but I did need to be able to control it in time. Mm -hmm. Dally doesn't do time. Right. DMX does time. So, okay. And I, when I looked at that, I went, well, that's just dumb. Like, what, what do you mean Dally doesn't do time? That's just dumb. <laughs> and somebody said to me, haven't you ever sat in a theater and watched the, like in a newly re renovated theater and watched the house lights go? And I said, yeah, yeah, because yeah, Dally doesn't do time. So, I, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a problem, right? How do you, you need, a, you need a protocol that will do all the different things that it, that both that i mean if we look at those two as sort of the the we're gonna i'm gonna call them the silver standards neither one of them is a gold standard because they mm -hmm. have you know dmx 512 has a distance limitation and an interference limitation dally has this weird time thing so like how do we how do we make them we can't make them both work because they are fundamentally different in the way that they handle information and now as soon as I've said that, now we are into a whole thing about layers of information and packets right. and all kinds of stuff that nobody wants to know about. I mean, even those of <laughs> well, us who care about this stuff don't really want to know about it. Okay. <laughs> debatable. Yeah. Net Network-based <laughs> protocols mean, I... for the win. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Well, anyways, we're, we're almost out of time here, so I, I, I want to package this up <laughs> in, in a nice bite-sized format, but um, we'll definitely have you back on to debate the merits of how to refer to DMX and 0 to 10 volt, <laughs> as well as to get in deeper about all of these standards requirements for standardizing a lighting controls protocol. But I mean, ultimately, you know, the, the read on where we are with lighting controls right now is that we are not where we want to be. We're not no. where we are ad as advertised yet. And while there's plenty of arguments to be made as to why we are where we are, some of the things that people can do to really make sure that we are moving in the right direction one, make sure you have a control intent narrative, clearly documented, thoroughly documented. We have heard this before. A clear and thorough narrative is going to be worth its weight in gold in comparison to a sloppy layout. 
you know, mm -hmm. if you say this is the expectation for the spaces, you don't even need to show devices on plan in some cases. And so mm -hmm. that's one of the things that, that our industry can really do to, to push the needle forward. Another thing that we can do is really encourage conversations with ownership and people who are stakeholders to the project. You know, the mm -hmm. owner project requirements is mm -hmm. a very hard to find thing. I personally have seen it in various states and it you're right, it's across the board. You know, you really don't know what to expect if you get it. Um, but really encouraging that that term become a ubiquitous term in our industry so that when you say, hey, do you have an OPR? The architect doesn't go, uh, what's an OPR? Why do we right. need that? Yeah. Or, oh, it's, it, it, you know, we're, we're halfway through it. Um, you know, we'll send it to you after CDs get issued. It's like, uh, <laughs> I kind of need that yeah. before CDs get issued. Uh, but then also, you know, the, the last thing that we can really do is as an industry, try and come to an agreement when it comes to what is best for us when it comes to practice. You know, sometimes we are really under the wire and we need to get that quote out immediately and we cannot push back and say, hey, you know, this isn't complete. But in a lot of cases, it's like, okay, this isn't complete. I need more information. I can't give you a full system. It's going to be disastrous if I give you something. Um, mm -hmm. And having people through and through the entire process say, no, this needs more information to, to go forward. Uh, but also, you know, when there's you know, a ma magic eight ball like phase dim, when it comes to dimming, you know, we need to really go, okay, what's the expectation here? Just because it says mm -hmm. dimmable doesn't mean that it's going to meet what dimmable means to the right. person. Mm -hmm. And so we really need to, to find a way to continue to engage people with that understanding. Yeah, okay, fine. It'll dim. It's not going to be attractive dimming, but it'll dim. Is that okay so with I, you? Yeah, I think that one of the things that we could do as, a, as an industry, as part of the sort of as industry leaders is maybe work on our definitions of some of those terms. Mm. I think mm -hmm. that mm. Um, if we would, for example, you know, the not to not to get on the mm. IES bandwagon too much, but the IES is an ANSI standard organization. So if the IES says dimmable means X, then guess what? Dimmable means X. That's what it means. We actually have the ability to define what some of these terms mean. So if we say that dimmable means you can see a linear relationship that is correlated with the a position on a potentiometer or the percentage of the amperage going to the lamp, or I mean, you could you can define it however yeah. you want. But if sure, you say yeah. I want to see X. And that's, if it doesn't do that, it's not dimmable. We actually do have the power to do that. We just have to sort of get ourselves together to do that, to, to own that power, I think, a little bit. I think that's a Maybe really that's good something point. the Lighting Controls Association could, you know, push on. Sure. I, we can definitely <laughs> elbow our, our colleagues over at LCA for that. Um, yeah. I mean, I, th I feel like if we if we stopped allowing something that didn't move from zero from 100 to 50 and then dropped out between 50 and 30, uh, <laughs> like if we stopped calling that dimmable and instead called it, I don't know, slow switching or just bad, um, then just bad, <laughs> just bad. Can we just call it bad? <laughs> yep. I just have this this image of, of one in the theater days where we would write NFG on on circuits. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yep. yep. Right. I well, mean, like, Shoshana, we just do that? thank you. Thank you. We, we could and we should. Absolutely. But yes, thank you so much for coming on today. We really appreciate your time. We will definitely have to have you come back on because we can dive into all of this so much more. Um, but like Webster said, you know, it, it is so important that we can get OPRs and that we can get design intent narratives and that we can get in front of owners. We've had this conversation with so many people now. Being able to get in front of the owner is so vitally important. And if we can get everyone to realize that. And now you've given the IES a giant task to to lift up. So <laughs> we're going to put that back on them. Oh, boy. <laughs> but that would be it would be great. I mean, it would be it's because you're right. And truly mock-ups are a huge thing. And I believe the same myself. Mock-ups are huge, especially like you said, I, I don't care if it's dimming or color changing or color tuning or the RGB white example. Mock-ups are so vitally important because renderings will only show you so much. And, and I will die on that hill. Absolutely. 
Um, but thank you so much for coming on today. We greatly, greatly appreciate it. Um, I just want to take a minute to remind everyone that today's episode is presented by the LCA, the Lighting Controls Association. And it's financially supported by the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors, or NAILED. Check out our website for the rest of our episodes, lightingcontrolspodcast.com. We've got an archive of our episodes, a news feed for industry news, as well as a merch store if you want to support the podcast. And additionally, thank you so much to our sponsor, McWong. Check them out, McWongInc.com. They provide an excellent wireless Bluetooth solution for lighting controls. They are based here in the U.S., have been involved in the U.S. for a long time, 40 years plus, and they are award-winning with a lot of their technology, and they even have excellent resources for those who are new to lighting controls or even veterans who just want to get an idea of how to design with their systems. Check them out, mcwonginc.com. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And Shoshana, a big thank you for joining us. This was a great conversation.